Infant of a diabetic mother. Scope of the problem. The infant of a diabetic mother, IDM, faces many risks that depend on the type of diabetes the mother has and how well it is controlled. The neonatal mortality rate is greater than five times that of infants born to mothers without diabetes, and congenital anomalies are three times more likely in IDMs. Cardiac, urinary tract, and gastrointestinal anomalies, neural tube anomalies, and sacral agenesis are most frequent. Cardiomegaly is common and may lead to heart failure. The incidence of anomalies is decreased with good control of diabetes before conception and during the early weeks of gestation, when fetal organs are being formed. It is not increased in women with gestational diabetes. Insulin acts as a growth hormone. The accelerated protein synthesis and the deposit of fat and glycogen in fetal tissues result in macrosomia. Strict control of the mother's blood glucose level, especially during the third trimester, reduces the risk for macrosomia. Infants with macrosomia are at risk for trauma during birth, including fracture of the clavicles from shoulder dystocia, cephalohematoma, and facial nerve and brachial plexus injury. When the mother is hyperglycemic, large amounts of amino acids, free fatty acids, and glucose are transferred to the fetus. Insulin does not cross the placenta because the molecules are too large. The excessive glucose received by the fetus causes the fetal pancreas to secrete large amounts of insulin and leads to hypertrophy of the islet cells. Hypoglycemia may occur after birth when the supply of glucose from the mother is no longer available, but the infant's high insulin production continues. Infants of mothers with long-term diabetes and vascular changes may have fetal growth restriction, which is also known as interuterine growth restriction, instead of macrosomia, because of decreased placental blood flow. Hypertension occurs more often in women with diabetes and further compromises utero-placental blood flow. The IDM has a higher risk for asphyxia and RDS. RDS occurs because increased levels of insulin block the effect of cortisol on stimulation of lung maturation. Other complications for which the IDM is at risk include hypocalcemia as a result of decreased parathyroid hormone production. Magnesium levels may also be low. Polycythemia may occur as a response to chronic hypoxia in utero. It may cause hyperbilirubinemia when a large number of RBCs break down after birth. In addition, IDMs are more likely to be born prematurely. Characteristics of infants of diabetic mothers. The IDM with macrosomia is different from other large for gestational age infants. The infant's size results from fat deposits and hypertrophy of the liver, spleen, and heart. The brain and kidneys are normal in size. The length and head circumference are also generally within the normal range for gestational age. Other LGA infants do not have enlargement of the organs and tend to be long with large heads to match the rest of their bodies. IDMs have a characteristic appearance. The face is round, the skin is often red, plethoric, and the body is obese. The infant has poor muscle tone at rest, but becomes irritable and may have tremors when disturbed. The SGA IDM is similar to infants who are SGA from other causes, but is more likely to have congenital anomalies. Therapeutic management. Therapeutic management includes controlling the mother's diabetes throughout pregnancy to decrease complications in the fetus and newborn. If the infant is large, there may be shoulder dystocia or cephalopelvic disproportion, and a cesarean birth may be required. Immediate care of respiratory problems and continued observation for complications determine treatment. Nursing considerations. Assessment. The IDM is assessed for signs of complications, trauma, and congenital anomalies at delivery and during the early hours after birth. Respiratory problems may be apparent at birth or may develop later. The initial assessment may reveal injuries. For example, an infant who cries when an arm is moved or fails to move an arm may have a fractured clavicle or nerve injury. Hypoglycemia occurs in 25 to 50 percent of infants of mothers with pregestational diabetes and 15 to 25 percent of those with gestational diabetes. It may be present without observable signs. The most frequent sign of low blood glucose is jitteriness or tremors. 
Diaphoresis is uncommon in newborns, but may occur with hypoglycemia. Rapid respirations, low temperature, and poor muscle tone are also common. Because these signs are not specific for hypoglycemia, the nurse should be alert for other complications, particularly if signs continue after feeding. Nursing interventions. The nurse assesses glucose levels according to hospital policy. Because these infants are at risk for hypoglycemia, they should have a blood glucose screen done shortly after birth and be monitored more frequently than other infants. Glucose levels reach the lowest point at one to three hours after birth and begin to improve by four to six hours. Glucose levels of less than 40 to 45 milligrams per deciliter measured with a bedside glucometer should be reported and verified by laboratory analysis. Infants should be fed early to prevent hypoglycemia and immediately if low blood glucose occurs to prevent further decreases. Gavage feeding may be used if the infant does not suck well or if respirations are rapid. The glucose level is rechecked in 30 to 45 minutes. Infants whose glucose levels are not maintained with feedings or whose condition does not allow enteral feedings need IV glucose to maintain glucose balance and prevent injury to the brain. The nurse should be alert for signs of other complications that occur in IDMs. RDS or other respiratory complications may develop. Cold stress, which increases the need for oxygen and glucose, could increase respiratory problems and exacerbate hypoglycemia. Infants with polycythemia need adequate hydration to prevent sluggish blood flow to vital organs and ischemia. Hypocalcemia may be suspected if tremors continue and the blood glucose concentration is normal. Providing support to parents is important. Greater than one-third of IDMs may have neurologic or developmental complications. The nurse should work with the infant and the parents to ensure feedings are adequate. Parents may have many questions for the nurse. They may not understand why their infant, who appears fat and healthy to them, needs close observation and frequent blood tests. The mother may have had a difficult pregnancy and may feel guilty, even if she followed a program of good diabetic control. Ample opportunity for discussion of feelings, as well as information about the care of the infant, is important. Polycythemia. In polycythemia, infants have a venous hematocrit greater than 65%. The increased viscosity of the blood causes resistance in the blood vessels and decreases blood flow. Blood flow to all organs is impaired. Organ damage from ischemia and venous thrombosis may result along with neurologic and developmental problems. Polycythemia also may result in hyperbilirubinemia as the excessive RBCs break down after birth. Causes. Polycythemia may occur when poor intrauterine oxygenation causes the fetus to compensate by producing more erythrocytes than normal. It is more common in infants who are post-term LGA or SGA or have FGR. It also occurs in infants of mothers who smoke or have hypertension or diabetes. Delayed cord clamping or a transfusion from one twin to another also may cause a condition. Manifestations. Most infants have minimal or no signs of polycythemia. Symptomatic infants may have a plethoric color, lethargy, irritability, poor tone, and tremors. Abdominal distension, decreased ball sounds, poor feeding, hypoglycemia, and respiratory distress also may be present. Hyperbilirubinemia occurs as RBCs are broken down. Therapeutic management. Treatment is primarily supportive. Infants who are asymptomatic are observed and receive increased hydration. A partial exchange transfusion may be performed if the hematocrit is above 70 to 75% in asymptomatic infants and 65% in infants with symptoms. Blood is replaced with normal saline to decrease the total number of RBCs. Phototherapy is used to treat the jaundice. Nursing considerations. Monitoring of bilirubin levels is important to determine whether phototherapy is necessary. Infants should be hydrated adequately to prevent dehydration that would slow already sluggish blood flow and increase ischemia to vital organs. If an exchange transfusion is performed, the nurse assists and watches for complications. Hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia is a total serum calcium concentration of less than 7 mg per deciliter. 
It is divided into early onset in the first 72 hours of age and late onset one week of age forms. Causes. Early onset hypocalcemia occurs most often in IDMs and in infants with asphyxia, prematurity, and delayed nutrition. Late onset hypocalcemia is caused by hypoparathyroidism, malabsorption, low magnesium levels, extensive diuretic therapy, and rickets. Manifestations. Signs of hypocalcemia include irritability, jitteriness, poor feeding, high pitched cry, muscle twitching, apnea, seizures, and electrocardiographic changes. It is often asymptomatic. Therapeutic management. Laboratory testing of serum calcium level determines the presence of the problem. IV calcium gluconate is given if feeding alone does not raise the calcium level. A cardiac monitor is necessary when IV calcium is given because bradycardia can occur. Nursing considerations. The nurse should be alert for signs of hypocalcemia. IV calcium should be administered slowly and stopped immediately if bradycardia or dysrhythmia develops. The IV site should be assessed frequently because infiltration can cause necrosis and ulceration. Prenatal drug exposure. Substance abuse affects the fetus at any time during pregnancy. Most drugs readily cross the placenta and cause a variety of problems. The effects of substance abuse on pregnancy, the fetus, and the neonate are discussed in Chapter 11. This section includes nursing care for infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome, NAS, a disorder in which infants exposed to maternal drugs before birth demonstrate signs of drug withdrawal. Identification of drug-exposed infants. Maternal substance abuse may be identified before an infant is born, but some infants are born to women whose substance use is not known to the healthcare professionals caring for them. A history of minimal or no prenatal care or the mother's behavior during labor may cause nurses to suspect substance abuse. When there is any reason to suspect drug use, the infant is observed closely for signs of prenatal drug exposure. NAS occurs in infants who have suffered prenatal opiate exposure sufficient to cause withdrawal signs after birth. Women who use heroin are generally switched to methadone or buprenorphine during pregnancy to decrease the incidence of wide variations in the drug dosage, which is harmful to the fetus. These women usually receive better prenatal care, and their infants have a higher birth weight than those exposed to heroin. However, infants may still undergo withdrawal after birth. NAS is also seen in some infants exposed to other drugs, such as amphetamines and antidepressants. Methamphetamine exposure results in lethargy, irritability, high pitch cry, and hypertonicity in infants. SSRIs and other antidepressants taken during pregnancy also result in NAS behaviors. Signs of drug exposure usually begin during the first 24 to 72 hours after birth, but may not occur for up to two weeks depending on the specific drug, the dose, and the time of the mother's last use. Use near the time of delivery causes a later onset but more severe signs of withdrawal. Polydrug use, along with use of alcohol and cigarettes, is common. This makes it difficult to determine which substance led to individual effects. Signs differ according to the drug or combination of drugs used but often include neurologic and GI abnormalities. Some infants with prenatal drug exposure show no abnormal signs at all. Infants with NAS may be irritable and have hyperactive muscle tone and a high-pitched cry. Although they have tremors, the blood glucose level is normal. Infants appear hungry and suck vigorously on their fists, but have poor coordination of suck and swallow. Frequent regurgitation, vomiting, and diarrhea are common. Infants are restless and their excessive activity coupled with poor feeding ability results in failure to gain weight. Seizures may occur. Various scoring systems are available to determine the number, frequency, and severity of behaviors that indicate NAS. The score is used when considering whether drug therapy to alleviate withdrawal signs is needed and to determine dosage. Behaviors are generally scored every two to four hours until low scores are obtained consistently. It is important that all nurses are able to use the scoring tool consistently to provide for optimal treatment of the infant. Congenital anomalies and other effects of prenatal drug exposure may be apparent at birth. 
FGR and prematurity are common. Infants are more likely to have respiratory problems at birth, jaundice, or sudden infant death syndrome. Infants with fetal alcohol syndrome have a characteristic appearance. When drug exposure is suspected, a urine specimen is collected for analysis. Drugs or their metabolites are present in the newborn's urine for various lengths of time after the mother has used them. Some drugs last several days because the infant's immature liver and kidneys delay excreting them, whereas others disappear very soon. Therefore, it is important to obtain the first urine output from the infant, if possible. Meconium analysis may detect drug exposure as far back as the second semester. A hair sample or a segment of umbilical cord is tested in some facilities. Therapeutic management. Because many signs of drug exposure are similar to those for other conditions, testing may be performed to rule out other causes. Sepsis, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, and neurologic disorders are possible causes for the infant's problems. In addition, the infant may have been exposed to infections from the mother, such as hepatitis or sexually transmitted diseases. Therapeutic management includes dealing with the complications common to drug-exposed infants during and after birth. Respiratory problems and those related to prematurity are treated as for other infants. Drug therapy may be necessary for approximately 50 to 60 percent of infants because of high scores on abstinence scales. Medications commonly used include oral morphine and methadone. Phenobarbital may be used for polydrug exposure. Buprenorphine and clonidine also have been used, but further studies are needed. Medication dosage is gradually tapered until the infant no longer needs it. Although these drugs help relieve the signs of withdrawal, all have side effects that may be undesirable. Because the infants suck and swallow are uncoordinated, gavage or IV feeding may be required. Some infants need more than the normal caloric requirements because of their excessive activity. The specific calories needed for each infant will be prescribed by the health care provider. Involvement by social services in and out of the hospital is important to deal with the long-term effects of the drugs. Placement of the infant after hospitalization and follow-up of the mother or other caregiver to help provide for the infant's needs. Nursing considerations. The infant who has been exposed to drugs prenatally needs special care to cope with drug withdrawal. Care is focused on minimizing withdrawal symptoms, encouraging feeding, promoting rest, and if possible, enhancing parental attachment. Feeding. Feeding can be difficult and time-consuming. The poor suck and swallow coordination of drug-exposed infants interferes with caloric intake, yet their excessive activity increases their caloric needs. Assessment. Infants often suck frantically on their fists or a nipple, but are unable to coordinate feeding behaviors well. The nurse should assess the infant's ability to suck and swallow with breathing. Changes in the frequency and amount of regurgitation, vomiting, or the length of time it takes infants to finish feedings should be noted. Nursing interventions. Gavage feedings may be necessary to conserve the infant's energy and prevent aspiration if the infant is excessively agitated, is unable to suck and swallow adequately, or has rapid respirations. The infant's excessive activity, poor sleeping, vomiting, and diarrhea increase the caloric need. The infant may need as many as 150 to 250 calories per kilogram each day. Formula with 24 calories or more per ounce instead of the usual 20 calories per ounce may be used. More frequent feedings may be needed as well. Distractions during feedings can be prevented by choosing a quiet, low activity area of the nursery for feedings. Infants should be swaddled to prevent the startling that occurs when drug exposed infants are handled. Stimuli such as rocking and talking should be kept to a minimum during feedings. After feedings, infants should be positioned on the right side with the head of the bed elevated 30 to 45 degrees. Some infants respond better to the prone position. If possible, the infant should be positioned in the supine position for sleep. Rest. The excessive activity and poor sleep patterns of drug-exposed neonates interfere with the ability to rest. Assessment. The infant's muscle tone, tremors, and tendency for excessive activity with and without being disturbed should be assessed. The degree of tremors and stimuli that increase or decrease irritability are important. The nurse also keeps track of the number of hours the infant sleeps after each feeding. Nursing interventions. Keep stimulation of the drug-exposed infant to a minimum, especially at first when the infant is excessively irritable. 
position the crib in the quietest area of the nursery, or ideally a private room. Place a sign nearby to remind others of the need for quiet near the infant. The number of different types of stimulation should be kept to a minimum and adapted to each infant's need. Reduce noise and bright lights as much as possible. If the infant shows signs of overstimulation, stop all activity briefly to allow rest. Swaddling the infant in a flex position helps prevent startling and agitation. Placing the excessively agitated infant in a dark, quiet room may be necessary. As the infant shows the ability to withstand stimulation, add new types of stimuli gradually one at a time. Some infants respond well to soft music, which has the added advantage of masking other environmental sounds. Organize nursing care to reduce handling and disturbances. Cluster care activities to avoid unnecessary interruptions yet provide rest periods if signs of stress occur. A calm approach and slow smooth movements during care help avoid startling the infant. A pacifier for non-nutritive sucking also helps quiet the infant. Skin abrasions from excessive activity and rubbing of the face, elbows, and knees may increase discomfort and agitation. Cover the infant's hands with mittens or the end of the shirt sleeves to help prevent facial scratching. Diaper rash from frequent diarrhea also may occur. Skin breakdown should be prevented if possible and treated promptly if it occurs. Placing the infant in the prone position promotes better sleep for some infants, but supine positioning should be used as soon as possible. Bonding. When maternal drug use is known or suspected, many hospitals require a three to five day observation period to monitor for appearance of withdrawal symptoms. If the infant is transferred to another unit for observation and the mother is discharged from the hospital without her baby, bonding is jeopardized. Many mothers do not understand the need for this observation period because they mistakenly think that if they are using prescription medication or switched from heroin to methadone or buprenorphine, their infant will not suffer from withdrawal. When an infant tests positive for drugs, Child Protective Services become involved. The infant may not be released to the mother until her ability to care for her infant safely has been assessed by social services or a court. She may be required to enter a drug rehabilitation program before she can obtain custody of the infant. After hospital discharge, the infant may be cared for by family members approved by the court in a foster home or in an institution. The mother will most likely gain custody of the infant eventually if she complies with court-ordered treatment, and attachment to the infant should be encouraged. Assessment. The frequency of the mother's visits and her response to the infant may give an indication of her apparent interest in the infant. Although some substance abusing mothers are uninterested in their infants, for others the infant provides a reason to attempt to overcome their addiction. Bonding behaviors such as calling the infant by name and smiling at the infant should be noted. Nursing Interventions Child neglect, abuse, and failure to respond appropriately to infant signals and cues are associated with alcohol and drug abuse. Because the mother may become the infant's primary caregiver, it is essential that nurses do whatever they can to enhance mother-infant bonding. Helping the mother feel welcome when she visits the infant poses a challenge. It is sometimes easy to be judgmental and difficult to be accepting of the mother whose behavior has been harmful to her infant. Yet a friendly approach will make the mother more likely to visit the infant and accept teaching from the nurse. Promote bonding by encouraging mothers to participate actively in infant care during visits. If the mother thinks the nurses trust her to care for the infant, her confidence may increase. This may encourage her efforts to go through rehabilitation to regain custody of her newborn. The mother's participation also provides a chance to assess her infant care skills and areas in which further discussion of the newborn's needs will be helpful. In addition, it gives the nurse an opportunity to demonstrate parenting skills. Many mothers who use drugs have not had good parenting role models and do not know how to care for an infant. Frequent positive feedback about the mother's participation is also important. Provide the mother the same teaching given to all new parents, as well as special techniques necessary to meet the needs of drug-exposed infants. Teach her about her newborn's unique characteristics and help her assume more of the infant's care as she demonstrates readiness. Teach the mother that infants are easily overstimulated. These infants cannot tolerate simultaneous visual and tactile stimulation. Signs of overstimulation in drug-exposed infants have some similarities with those for preterm infants. In addition, some infants cannot tolerate more than brief periods of interaction. 
They may not make eye contact, or they may avert their eyes after 30 to 60 seconds of social interaction. Cuddling and soothing to console the infant may not elicit the same response in these infants as in other infants. Teach the mother that the infant responds poorly to everyone, so she does not think that only she is being rejected. Parents of a drug-exposed infant may experience feelings of rejection, frustration, and even hostility when the infant stiffens while being held, cries after being fed, or looks away. Explain that drug-exposed infants are easily stressed because of the decreased stability of their CNS. Emphasize that the infant needs gentle handling. Also explain that crying indicates a need, not a spoiled infant. Show the mother comfort measures that work best for her infant. These infants are often comforted when they are snugly swaddled in a flex position with their hands brought to midline. Holding the swaddled infant close to the mother's body may increase comfort. Some infants are consoled with slow rhythmic vertical or horizontal rocking movements. Placing them in a front pack as the nurse or mother moves around may also be comforting. When the infant is nearing discharge, explain that sleep problems will probably continue at home. The infant should sleep in a quiet room because normal household noises will disturb the drug-exposed infant more than other infants. Cocaine, amphetamines, heroin, and other drugs pass into breast milk. Trying to breastfeed an infant with poorly developed feeding skills may be too much stress for the mother who is trying to recover from addiction. Therefore, mothers who are likely to continue drug use after delivery should be discouraged from breastfeeding. Women taking methadone may be allowed to breastfeed if they are not taking other drugs that are contraindicated. Methadone and buprenorphine have been found to be at very low levels in breast milk and may result in lower pharmacologic treatment doses and duration. Breastfeeding assistance should be given to women who are interested because of the advantages of breast milk over formula and because it may help the mother with bonding. Provide information and referral to any special programs available to help parents learn stimulation techniques appropriate for drug-exposed infants. Some withdrawal signs may continue for four to six months, and the mother needs to know how to cope with them. If the mother is unable or not allowed to care for the newborn after discharge, the same interventions can be used to help the person who will take over care of the infant. Phenylketonuria. PKU is a genetic disorder that causes CNS injury from toxic levels of the amino acid phenylalanine in blood. The incidence is 1 in 10,000. Severe cognitive impairment occurs in untreated infants and children. In the United States, all newborns are screened for this condition before or shortly after discharge from the birth facility. Positive screening tests are followed by other testing to confirm the diagnosis. Causes PKU is caused by a deficiency of the liver enzyme phenylalanine hydrolase, which is necessary to convert phenylalanine to tyrosine for use. It is an autosomal recessive disorder. Manifestations Signs of untreated disease may begin with digestive problems and vomiting and later progress to seizures, musty odor of the urine, and severe cognitive impairment. Older children have eczema, hypertonia, hyperactive behavior, cognitive impairment, and hypopigmentation of the hair, skin, and irises. Therapeutic management Treatment is a low phenylalanine diet that should start immediately after the diagnosis is made and continue throughout life to avoid irreversible neurologic damage. Women with PKU who are not following the diet closely need to return to it before they conceive and throughout pregnancy to prevent abnormalities in the fetus. Infants with PKU receive a special formula low in phenylalanine and low protein foods are introduced when solids are started. Small amounts of phenylalanine are allowed because it is a necessary amino acid. Early and continued treatment is necessary to prevent or minimize cognitive impairment. Nursing considerations. The nurse should be sure that all newborns are screened for PKU at the appropriate time in the birth facility. Screening performed before 24 hours of age should be repeated because the infant may not yet have consumed enough protein for the test to be accurate. The nurse assists parents in regulating the diet to meet the infant's changing phenylalanine needs. Parents may need to talk about their feelings regarding the difficulty of following the diet for their children. They can be reassured that good control helps avoid long-term neurologic problems. However, mild decrease in intelligence and behavioral difficulties may occur. Congenital anomalies 
Approximately 2% of newborns have a major malformation at birth. Congenital anomalies are the leading cause of death in the first year of life. Some infants have more than one anomaly, which may be part of a syndrome or result from unrelated causes. Although congenital anomalies generally are treated in the pediatric setting, they are often identified soon after birth. Common congenital anomalies are noted in Box 24.1. Congenital cardiac conditions are discussed in this section. Okay, so I'm going to skip a couple pages uh, just specific to not studying certain things in an R program. We're going to pick up on page 689 under Manifestations. Manifestations. Congenital heart defects may present obvious signs at birth or may not become apparent until later when changes from fetal to neonatal circulation are completed. Some infants have no difficulty for months or years, but others experience early heart failure. The most common indications of cardiac problems are cyanosis, heart murmurs, tachycardia, and tachypnea. Cyanosis. Cyanosis is a major sign of cardiac anomaly when it is not a result of respiratory disease. If the cyanosis is caused by mixing of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood, giving oxygen will not improve the infant's color. Cyanosis increases with crying, feeding, or other activity. Pallor, mottling, or a gray color may be present in infants who do not have cyanosis. Heart murmurs. Murmurs may sound like clicks, machinery, rumbling, swishing, or other muffled noises. It takes much practice to detect heart murmurs accurately. Although many infants have a temporary murmur until the fetal structures are closed, all abnormal sounds should be referred to the provider. Tachycardia and tachypnea. Tachycardia and tachypnea may occur any time the heart and lungs must work harder to provide sufficient oxygen to the body. Therefore, they are present in both respiratory conditions and cardiac conditions. They increase in congestive heart failure. Other signs. Fatigue and tachypnea may interfere with the infant's ability to eat. Infants may feed slowly and take small amounts. They may fall asleep before the feeding is finished because of the effort required for sucking. As a result, weight gain may be slow. Although diaphoresis is uncommon in the newborn, it may appear during feedings in the infant with a heart defect. Critical to remember, common signs of cardiac anomalies. Cyanosis increased from crying. Pallor, murmurs, tachycardia, tachypnea, dyspnea, choking spells, poor intake, falling asleep during feedings, diaphoresis. Therapeutic management. Therapeutic management involves diagnosis of the specific defect and supportive and surgical treatment as indicated. Various tests such as echocardiograms and cardiac catheterizations confirm the diagnosis. The decision for surgery depends on the status of the infant and whether surgery can be delayed safely. Palliative surgery may be performed to partially correct a defect or make another defect to allow greater amounts of oxygenated blood to get to the systemic circulation. Oxygen and drugs such as digitalis, diuretics, potassium supplements, and sedatives may be prescribed for the infant. Prostaglandins may be given to prevent the ductus arteriosus from closing in those cases in which keeping it open will increase the flow of oxygenated blood in the infant's body. Nursing considerations. Nursing care is focused on assessing for changes in condition and reducing the infant's need for oxygen. The need for rest is especially important and the infant's response to all activity is evaluated. Infants with rapid respirations are at risk for aspiration and may need feeding by gavage. Oxygen may be increased during feeding or other exertion, but only enough oxygen to maintain saturation levels adequately should be used. Frequent rest periods are provided by clustering small units of nursing care. Feeding with increased calories may be used to promote nutrition and weight gain. Accurate intake and output measurements are necessary. Maintaining a neutral thermal environment is important to avoid increasing oxygen need. Support of the parents and education about the infant's condition and expected treatment are essential. The physician may use drawings to help parents understand the defect and plans for surgery. The nurse verifies the parent's understanding and provides additional teaching as necessary. The parents are taught techniques for accurate administration of medications because the range between the therapeutic and toxic dosage of the drugs is narrow. Parents may be referred to support groups for families of children with heart anomalies.